You know, last week when Zach preached, it was a small respite for me. But the main reason that you'll see people like Zach preach here is not because I need a break, but much more so that they can develop their gift of preaching that God has given and that we can then be blessed by their teaching. I think it's a very strong local church when we have a unity in vision and truth and doctrine, but it's expressed in a multiplicity of voices. And we saw that also in our Holy Month devotions that we had many people in our body that God has gifted to share that gifting and share the same truth, but with different voices. And that makes us stronger. And I feel that that's a calling and a joy on me to help develop those gifts. And I'm glad God is doing that here. Once again, I'm thankful to my brother Zach for preaching last Sunday. Yet, almost immediately as I started to study the scripture for this week, Zach, I wondered if you actually didn't preach the wrong week. I was wondering if we got the schedule wrong and I was supposed to preach Genesis 33 and then he could preach Genesis 34 because, brothers and sisters, this is a terribly difficult text. It's, it's hard to read this one to yourself, much less stand up and explain it to nice folks like yourselves. But as we read today this difficult text, this challenging text, I want us to keep two things in mind as we just read this. The first is that there's, the Bible has an amazing authenticity. When we read Scripture, this doesn't come across as detached philosophy or kind of glossed over hallmark sentimentality. Rather, the Bible comes across as real, like everyday life real. And the Bible doesn't shy away from the grittier or the raw topics of life. As I read these words today, they ring true to me like headlines that I scroll through from the news. It reads to me that they were suffering the same problems that we're still suffering. Rape and murder, violence, brutality, genocide, self-centeredness, idolatry, disregard for others, deceit, manipulation. The kind of things that make you ask the question, how can people do this to each other? But as I read this, it's also authentic because I say, wow, I see myself on this page. That's my jealousy there. That's my anger. That's my deceit. That's my selfishness, my apathy. That's my sin. And when we see this authenticity in the Bible today from this scripture, we see that these are real people. They're complex people. They're nuanced people. They're not cartoons. They are people that have mixed motives and understandable motives. It's hard to completely exonerate anyone, but it's also hard to condemn some of them because there's some good and some bad. There are people like Jacob who know the Lord and have turned to serve and follow God, but they still stumble in sin and faithlessness. They still have trust issues with God. There's people like Simeon and Levi who have, in a way, honorable intentions, but they carry it out in reprehensible actions. There are people here who know God, and yet when they are in danger, they neither turn to him or call out on him or trust him. I know people like that because I'm people like that. And when I read this, it's authentic, it's real. And the other thing to keep in mind as we read this today in this challenging text is there's an amazing accuracy in the Bible. It's true. If this book is not true, I can't think of a reason that it would include this chapter that we're going to read. Because if this is just a nation-building myth, something that people did to try to explain their origins and prop themselves up and give them pride for their people, why on earth would you say your founding fathers are genocidal liars? Why would you write this stuff in here? 
The only reason I can think of is because the Bible is true. And since God in his wisdom has decided to include Genesis 34 in his Holy Scripture, then we ought to read it and we ought to come to understand it. And an understanding that we want to know is in all Scripture is what does this reveal about God? What does it reveal about me? And how does this connect to what Jesus Christ accomplished in his death and resurrection for my redemption? Well, I've stalled long enough. We have to actually read this. So turn with me to Genesis 34. Lord, we pray as we come to your word to hear you authentically, to hear you accurately. We ask that you will speak to us even through this challenging text, that you will convict our hearts, that you will renew our minds, that you will comfort our spirits, and that you will lead us to you. Show us who you are, Lord, and change us in the hearing and the doing of your word today. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Genesis 34, now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, the prince of the land, saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. And his soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father, Hamor, saying, Get me this girl for my wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled his daughter Dinah, but his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob had come in from the field as soon as they heard it, and the men were indignant and very angry because he had done an outrageous thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing must not be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him to be his wife. Make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it and get property in it. Shechem also said to her father and to her brothers, Let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me for as great a bride price and gifts as you will, and I will give whatever you say. Only give me the young woman to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully, because he had defiled their sister Dinah. They said to them, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we agree with you, that you will become as we are, by every male among you being circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to ourselves, and we will dwell with you and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we will be gone. Their words pleased Hamor and Hamor's son Shechem. And the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. Now he was the most honored of all of his father's house. So Hamor and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city saying, These men are at peace with us. Let them dwell in the land and trade in it, for behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters as wives and let us give them our daughters. Only on this condition will the men agree to dwell with us to become one people, when every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised. Will not their livestock, their property, and all their beasts be ours? Only let us agree with them and they will dwell with us And all who went out of the gate of his city listened to Hamor and his son Shechem. And every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. 
On the third day, when they were sore, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem with the the swords and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went away. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because they had defiled their sister. They took their flocks and their herds, their donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field, all their wealth, all their little ones and their wives, all that was in the houses they captured and plundered. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me stink to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. My numbers are few, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed, both I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister like a prostitute? Well, this is the word of God, and two words today for us to hold on to. One comes from the text, and one is, lacking in this text. The first is defiled. There's there's defilement all over this chapter. And the next is redemption. What will take away that defilement? What will fix this? What will redeem this? Defiled and redeemed. This is what I wrote for my headline of my summary. You can write this down or you can come up with your very own. Jesus Christ redeems and rebuilds what I defiled and destroyed. Jesus redeems and rebuilds what I defiled and destroyed. Our text today comes in really four parts, and we'll add on a five to talk about that redemption. It comes in a rape, comes in a request, then there's revenge, And then in 30 and 31, there's the response. There's a rape, there's a request, there's a revenge, there's a response. And then what's missing we need to get to is the gospel. Where's the redemption? Where's the redemption here? Well, the first one is the rape. We see that God's creation here is defiled in sin. We see that in the first four verses, but there's defilement all over this. And here it starts in the rape of Dinah. You know, the very first act of Israel or Jacob re-entering Canaan came at the end of the last chapter in 33. And Israel, he built an altar on the land of Shechem and he called it God, the God of Israel. And it seems a great turning point in his life. He has accepted the Lord Yahweh as his God and he says, I will follow him. But the second event upon Israel re-entering Canaan is this. His daughter Dinah goes out into the land and she is seen and then she's seized and then she's humiliated and then she's courted for marriage. It seems to start off innocently enough. New in a new land, Dinah, the only daughter of Jacob, goes out to meet some girls goes out maybe to make friends. It's ominous in the book of Genesis when we read those words, the women of the land. That is kind of something that's a clue that these are not people that Israel should mix with. Please hear me correctly. Dinah did not do anything to deserve this atrocious act. But we heard this kind of language earlier when Rebecca stomped her feet and refused to let Jacob marry the women of this land and sent him away. But there she is, Dinah. She's among the women of the land when one of the men of the land approaches and he does what her brothers call an outrageous thing, something that must not be done. This is how Moses, our narrator, captures the details. And when Shechem the son of Hamor the Hivite, the prince of the land, a powerful man. When he saw her, he seized her and lay with her and humiliated her. The verbs just shoot out like bullets. This was forcible rape. There was no consent here. This was an attack. This word, he humiliated her, is is rendered in 2 Samuel 
that she was violated. She was shamed. She was afflicted. This is a sexual violence that is always unexcusable. Simply put, this is sin. This is evil. And we learn from verse 26 that Dinah has actually been captured because her brothers will liberate her from Shechem's home. He has taken her into his house. She seems trapped. I don't have to think, I have to convince you, the jury here today, that this is a heinous act. It's the kind of abuse that isn't undone by saris. This is scarring. This is painful. It's lasting. She has been defiled. Well, what does that mean, though? Defiled. Biblically speaking, it means though that Dinah was created in the image of God, she was treated as one who was not made in the image of God. Though God has imputed value to her as his creation, she was treated as something valueless. Shechem treated her as an object. He defiled, in a sense, the image of God that was upon her. He has treated her as less than God intended for human beings to be treated, as less than she deserved, because it's less than God designed it to be so and commanded it should be. And she has been treated as something to be consumed and then thrown out, rather than being treated as a human being. So I'm going to say she has been defiled. Her honor has been attacked. Her virtue has been soiled. But her body, her mind, her heart have been attacked in this. She has been defiled by that. Again, I don't think I have to convince you of this, but she has been treated in a way that sexually dishonors the Lord God. She has been treated in a way sexually that human beings were not created to be. So it's an unrighteous, it's undeserving unholy, destructive act that has happened. I don't need to convince you this is bad, and the good news is, at least today, even in the, as our world gets darker, I don't have to convince the world around us that this is bad. At least our world still thinks this would be wrong, right? That's good news. <laughs> the bad news is what is surrounding that. The bad news is that culturally speaking, the only thing left that is sexually off limits to us is non-consensual sexual acts. That's the only taboo left in our almost tabooless culture. I've been slightly amazed by two recent sports stories. One is this out-of-work college football coach named Les Miles, and he's been fired and he's unemployable because he has done bad things. He, he made these sexual advances towards young aides in his sports program. And because he's a person of power, these were coercive suggestions. They were manipulative. They were predatory. They were dangerous. They were non-consensual. And he's paying the price for his terrible actions. But the shocking thing is that in all the news articles I read about this, it's never mentioned that he has a wife. And the headlines read like this. As much as I read them, powerful men doing bad things to vulnerable women, wrong. Adultery, no comment. Unfaithful husband, leave that alone. Another article that was similar that's in the news coming up a lot is this guy named Deshaun Watson. He's a, a quarterback who is in boiling hot water, and he's a professional football player, and he has 20-something allegations of, of lawsuits against him that they're alleging that he forced himself upon these women. That's what the women are claiming. Awful stuff. Outrageous things that must not be done. But again, the papers read like this. Powerful men forcing himself on vulnerable women, wrong. Hundreds of acts of fornication, no comment. Cheating on his girlfriend, 
Don't touch that. I think this is worth mentioning because the sins in all of these cases, it's defilement. The sexual defilement. People treating other people not as those made in the image of God. People treating other people not as God designed or wants people to be treated. And this is worth mentioning because even though they don't seem to be in the same category, and it's not exactly apples to apples, biblically speaking, this defiling rape and consensual sex that happens outside the bonds of covenant marriage, they are both defiling. When we make human sexuality into whatever we want it to be to please ourselves, to satisfy our eyes and our hearts, we defile ourselves and we defile other people and we disrespect the word of God and God himself. I don't pretend that we're all Shechem's here, but look how this happened. He saw someone beautiful that he wanted and then he reached out and took what he wanted and then he carried about on with his life as if no big deal had happened. You know, the very language that is here should strike us because it's eerily similar to the language in Genesis 3. When in the garden, Eve saw something with her eyes that she saw was beautiful and desirable, and she reached out and took it and seized it because she wanted it. And then she consumed it. She ate her heart's desire. And then she gave it to her husband like it was no great big deal. And in the aftermath of seeing and seizing and taking, they were humiliated. They were violated. They were defiled for going against what God had said in the way life ought to go. Shechem is just the same. And so are we when it comes to sexual sin and a host of other sins. We see something that looks good to us, that seems right in our eyes, and we prefer our ways over God ways, and we reach out and we take it, what we want in this life. We do what we want, what we feel is good, what we think is beautiful and will satisfy us. And when we have it against God's will, it leaves us humiliated and violated and defiled. That's often how sin happens. Sexually today, we don't go about things usually the way Shechem did, praise be to God. It's hard to understand. He obviously does an atrocious act. But he sounds like his want-to-be future father-in-law, Jacob. He seems obsessed with a woman who will do anything to get her. His request, I will pay anything, sounds eerily like Jacob's own words. I'll work however long it takes. Just give me what I want. But our culture does often what Shechem does in the same order. First comes sex then comes love, and then maybe comes marriage. But God has given us in his word an order that is all the way the opposite in Genesis 2. First, the man leaves his mother and father and cleaves to his wife in a covenant union, and they become a one flesh entity. They are united together, and then they consummate the marriage and in that, Genesis 2 tells us there is no defilement, there is no sin, for they have followed God's design, and it says they are naked but unashamed because they have followed God's word. Shechem has defiled, though, Dinah. He's defiled her honor, he's defiled her virtue because he has treated her unlike someone should be treated. He hasn't treated her as an image bearer of God. But you know this, brothers and sisters, something we need to live out and something we need to tell our children and our grandchildren, we too 
defile each other every time we operate outside of God's Word. Every time. Including every single way we operate sexually that does not fit with what God has designed and what He has declared as good and holy and righteous and pleasing to Him. The Bible has a very clear word that our culture doesn't have for consensual sex outside covenant marriage. It's called fornication. And God doesn't smile upon it, but He hates it. And it's wrong and it's defiling for every gender, for same gender relationships and opposite gender relationships. No matter how much you love each other, no matter how right it feels, no matter how much you feel you deserve this or want this or how pleasing it looks, no matter how much we feel it's not hurting anyone, the Bible says it's defiling everyone. What God meant for good and for holiness and for His glory, we take it and repurpose it to satisfy our own personal desires and our lust. And that is an outrageous thing that must not be done. Well, that's what happens. She's raped, and it's awful. It's defilement. And then comes this request in verses 8 through 12. And the request sounds like this. Come and be just like us. Come and be like us. Come and mix with us. In verse 6, Hamor the father goes out to Jacob to speak with him. And then in verse 8, he says the offer, make marriages with us. Verse 9, give your daughters to us. You shall dwell with us, and the land will be open to you. That's the offer. That's the request. Shechem's request is, give me Dinah. His father's request is, mix with us. And it's almost impossible, really, biblically, to overestimate the danger that is imminent in this simple request. The original readers would have sensed it immediately. Wait, 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 wait. They're not actually going to intermarry, are they? Because what's at stake here is the covenant promises with the covenant people. God has brought them out and put them in this land. And very salvation history seems to hinge on the fact, will they follow God or will they intermarry and walk away from God? Well, what's the big deal here? It seems like a generous enough offer. Come, let's intermarry. You'll have peace. We'll share the land. But the Lord's objection to Israel intermarrying isn't one about racial intermarriages. God's not concerned about racial mixing. God's not concerned, in a sense, about cultural mixing. What God is concerned very much about is religious and spiritual mixing. Hamer's offer here is exactly what Deuteronomy 7 prohibits, especially in verses 3 and 4. Deuteronomy 7 says, You shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. But why? God answers in the same verse. For they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. The women of the land and the men of the land in Genesis 34 are Hivites. They are people that are specifically mentioned in that same chapter of Deuteronomy 7. They are mentioned again and again in all the lists through the Old Testament about people that Israel cannot intermarry with, people that the Lord God is driving out of Israel as he brings in Israel to the land. And the Lord has a very good reason for this. This is what he tells in Deuteronomy 7 in the sixth verse. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are in the face of the earth. Hold on to that, verse 6. God has specific and he has unique reasons for Israel. He has called them out to set them apart as his people, not because in themselves they are special, but because he loved them and chose them in grace. And he has set them apart 
to be a light in a dark world. To share his law in a lawless world. To share of his grace in an unjust world. To talk about the true God, Yahweh, in a world full of false gods. But the story of Israel across the Old Testament usually plays out in the exact opposite. They do intermarry and they do intermix and they turn into the people of the land surrounding them. Instead of leading them to the Lord God, often Israel turns to worship the people's idols and take on their sinful behavior. God knew this would happen. And it's such a big deal to God for his people that they will not be turned away from him to follow false gods. It's such a big deal to him that this isn't just an Old Testament kind of thing. It's in a New Testament. It's for his church. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 18. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? What portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? Therefore, go out from their midst and be separated from them. This doesn't mean, brothers and sisters, that all Christians are to live like the Amish. To be sequestered away from the world where we don't have friendships or business with the people of the world. But it does mean that Hamor's seductive call to Jacob is equally seductive in our world today. The culture around us calls to us, intermix with us. Be like us. Come. Come. Share in our ways. Synchronize and you'll be safe. Walk like us and talk like us. Consume like us. Desire like us. Love like us. Live like us and then you'll have peace. Don't be so different than us, but blend in. Do you feel that call of the world around you? In your office, in your schools, in your friendships? The church needs to always be aware of exactly how much it's listening to the call of culture instead of the call of Christ. We always need to be aware as God's church how much we look like the world instead of looking like Christ. We are called as his people to be set apart for his purposes, not because we're better than other people, but God has saved us and redeemed us to be a light to this world, not to become like this world. And we must hear this, as Christians, we have absolutely no permission from God to marry with non-believers. The Lord knows that far too often the non-Christian is not converted, but the Christian becomes compromised. That's not a statement about the Lord's power to change people. He changes many spouses to follow the Lord. But I think... 2 Corinthians here is a statement that God knows our weak hearts and our sinful nature and we are prone in unequally yoked marriages to take the path of least resistance. And oftentimes the Christian spouse gets worn down. It gets harder and harder to get the kids dressed, to get them to church, to go alone. And then one day it gets harder just to get yourself dressed to get to church. And it gets hard to sit alone. It gets hard to walk with the Lord alone, to serve alone. And then one day, often, they're gone. The path of least resistance has turned in. I just don't want to nag him or her anymore. It's easier just to go to brunch. It's easier not to show up at church alone. Far too often, that unequal yoke, it just wears you down to the detriment of your church life and sometimes to the destruction of your spiritual life. I want to say a word of encouragement, especially to any ladies, let's just say, out of your 20s. Be patient. 
If you feel like you're ready to throw in the towel, I can understand the temptation. I've heard it and I know it. You date a guy who's not a Christian and you say, but he's nicer than the guys I meet at church. Or there are no guys at church. I don't want to grow old alone. I love him. I want to encourage you, even if you feel your time is running out, be patient in the Lord. I have no easy answer for you, but this series is called Trust Issues because we all need to learn to continue to grow in trust. Hold on. God is in control just like he was at Shechem that day. They did not need to intermarry to be happy. God knew what he was doing. The temptation is very enticing, but it's very dangerous. The Lord knows often where it leads Hold on and wait and follow and trust the Lord. And if you're already in such a marriage, please understand I'm not heaping criticism on you. The Lord God himself does not condemn you and therefore I will never do that. I turn you to 1 Corinthians 7. It has answers for you. 1 Corinthians 7, how you are to live. And this week we've put even more I believe, inspiring articles on our growth resources that will help you if you are in that situation. The Lord doesn't condemn you. Be hopeful and stay close to the Lord and his people. I know it's hard, but stay praying for your spouse and stay praying for your spouse and stay praying for your spouse. The Lord can change hearts. Follow the Lord's leading And stay close to your brothers and sisters. Don't run away because you need them and they need you. And if you come to our church and you don't have a spouse or your spouse doesn't come with you, we don't think anything less of you. Come here and be fed and go home and share that good news and stay trusting the Lord God. Well, back to Jacob and Hamor there. Why was this request so important? We're told that Shechem loves this girl. He really loves her and he wants him to be his wife. But we also see that this is something more than love. It's about money, isn't it? They say that. At this time, these kind of intermarriages were about alliances. They were about treaties. Hamor is offering to Jacob and Israel, his sons, come and be like us. Do this and you'll be safe with us. But Israel, Jacob, cannot do this thing. And Israel, Jacob, does not need to do this thing. Jacob doesn't need to worry about getting property. The Lord God has always already promised him, in covenant promise, the entire land more than Shechem. He doesn't need this to open trade routes. The Lord God has graciously enriched him beyond his wildest dreams. He doesn't need this to be safe in the land because the Lord God has promised him, I am your shield and I will be with you all the way back through Canaan. So what Hamor is offering is something the Lord God forbids and he's offering something the Lord God has already promised. When I see that, it reminds me so much of the world around me that is also tempting me with things that God forbids. And it's trying to give me things that only God can give me and that he's already promised me. Things like joy, security, purpose, identity, meaning, hope, salvation, true love. It's not out there to be found. It comes from the Lord God. Well, that's the rape, that's a request, and that leads us to the meat of all of this, the revenge, where there is just injustice upon injustice. There has been a serious defilement, so what is the father Jacob going to do? It appears in verse 5 he's going to do nothing. Nothing. We don't know. It's, he's, he's really mature and trusting God. He wants to cool down. Or he doesn't actually even care that much about what happened. But we know clearly how her brothers feel. 
They erupt in anger. They are hot, burning. They're indignant and they're grieved. They say what has happened is an outrageous thing. That, that word means something like complete foolishness or silliness. It's, it's such a disgrace that it's unspeakable. It's like, who in the world could do such a thing? It's so bad. This must be a maniac. And they erupt and they quickly plot their plans for revenge. They say in a counteroffer, no, 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 we're not going to become like you. You become like us. You become like us. These guys seem to have inherited their father's lies and their uncle's wrath. It says they, they step over Jacob and they answer Hamor. They answer Shechem. They speak and they say there's one condition. You have to get circumcised. You're going to become like us. And the irony is thick here. They say, you know what? We couldn't marry uncircumcised people. That would be a disgrace. But lying to you and slaughtering you, that's okay. They say to them, you will become as we are. But what are they? They're liars. They're murderers. They're hateful and vengeful. They're genocidal. The sad reality again here is the Hivites won't become like the Israelites. The Israelites are becoming like the people of the land, godless and lawless, selfish, sacrilegious. Look how they lay the trap. They lay it with the covenant rite of circumcision. This is a thing that is outrageous. This is something that should not be done. They take what God has meant for the covenant seal of his people and they turn it into something for their selfish, ungodly purpose of vengeance. They take something God meant for holiness and they defile it for their personal lust of anger. They take something God made to display his covenant promise of love and they use it for hate. They take something that God meant as a covenant blessing and they turn it into a vehicle of death and destruction. It's almost like we say to people, you know, the central part of our faith and worship is communion. So why don't you come and worship like us? Come take communion with us, like us Christians, and then we poison the bread in the cup. Say, this means so much to us, and then we use it to kill people. It's horrible. And the Hivite men, they agree to it. They agree. And the trap has been set. I mean, what it takes for this man Shechem, I don't know what kind of love or infatuation he has. He is willing as a grown man to volunteer for circumcision. And then he can get his whole town to do it. Because he's the man of honor. He's the prince of the land. And it's his city and it's his gate, the text tells us. And the irony just gets thicker and thicker. It would almost be laughable if it wasn't so sad and sinful. The Hivites say, look, look, they're at peace with us. But they're going to get slaughtered by them. The Hivites say, look, we'll take all their stuff and get enriched off of it. But their dreams for monetary gain is going to quickly turn into a nightmare. Everything they have is going to be taken by the Israelites. It's going to be complete reversal. So the trap is set, and it says, when everyone felt secure, Simon and Levi came in for vengeance. Simon and Levi are sons two and three from Leah and Jacob. They are Dinah's full brothers. And it seems that they see our sister has been taken, so we're going to take up swords. And while these men in the city have been cut, Simeon and Levi go to completely cut them down. They want to finish them off. Now we can appreciate a little bit of the authenticity and accuracy of this situation. These men of these Hivites have also been deceitful. They've also acted in sin. There is no police 
for the Israelites to go to. There is no court of justice. The only court is at the gate of Shechem and he owns the city. If they go and try to only deal with Shechem and Hamor, these are the loved king and prince of this land. They're going to have to fight all these people anyway. And honestly, we don't know what would happen even if they flatly refused to intermarry because it seems that that was a trap even by the Hivites. They took their daughter, have her as captive and says, can we get married? And if you say no, what do you think happens? They still have to go get her by force, it seems. And then we can see why they turn to deceit. They're outmanned, they're outgunned. There's no way they could win in a straight up fight, so they lie and they cheat. All's fair in war, right? Wrong. Even though that's all true, Simon and Levi, even though they should be outraged at what happened to their sister, they're not justified in what they did. They answer depravity with greater depravity. They answer sin with heaps of more sin. They answer injustice with more injustice. Just as Shechem's love or lust, it doesn't justify his rape, their indignation doesn't justify their genocide, and it certainly doesn't justify their plundering of an entire city and taking everything. There's nothing in the Bible that condones these actions. God did not tell them to do this. They went up and assumed it. They became gods. They became their own judges and they executed their own judgment. As I read this, it sounds like every single action movie I've ever seen. And when I've watched those movies, I've been cheering for the heroes. It's always like an A-team level, two to five guys. They're outmanned and outgunned, and they got to go rescue the princess and wipe everyone out in the process. And you're like cheering while you watch this. But what's the premise behind every one of these movies? Why are we cheering? It's because in almost all of them, justice has broken down. The courts don't work. So they need to take things into their own hands. There's only one way left to them. They have to do it. Well, brothers and sisters, we know today courts fail. Even in a good country like ours, the police can be corrupt. Justice might fail us. But we opened our service by reading Psalm 9, and I encourage you this week to go back to it. What it says is, the Lord God plunders the enemies and he sits on his throne. Those who think they're in victory will be dealt with by the Lord God himself. And it's him who needs to judge because it's his perfect wrath, it's his perfect justice, it's his perfect wisdom in his perfect way and perfect time. I am inc incapable to do it because I turn in acting like Simeon and Levi. I don't want to just make things even. I want to put people in their place and humiliate them and knock them completely off. I don't want an eye for an eye. I want a whole body for that eye. But the Lord God knows what he is doing. He wants justice even more than we do. And we need to trust that he's in control to do that. We heard last week, the sin that we commit, our defiling, it offends God first and foremost. He cares more about Dinah than her brothers even do. He's in control. And God has a choice. He can wipe out everyone like these brothers try to do. But God really wants to wipe out all of our sin instead of wiping out all of us. Well, we end up here with this gigantic mess. Defilement, destruction, and no one has turned to God. No one has sought him for refuge. No one has waited on him for his justice or wisdom. No one has taken refuge in him. And it's just about to get worse. Very briefly in the response, what happens in verse 30 and 31 What's Jacob going to do in the end? All this destruction, all this defilement, what's the patriarch going to do? Nothing. His answer is, you've brought trouble on me. You've made me stink. You've hurt my reputation. 
And in Jacob's response, he doesn't seem worried about what's happened to Dinah. He doesn't worry about the danger of intermarriage. He doesn't condemn his sons for all that they have done. He's only angry because he says, this is going to cost me my life maybe. I'm in danger. He has no comforting words for his daughter. He has no call to repentance for his sons. He's worried about saving his own skin. We see a man, though he loves God, he has ongoing trust issues that God will actually protect him. That God would forgive his sons. We see a man that is still morally weak and unable to stand up, it seems, at times for truth and for God's ways. Well, there's no good news in this chapter. But we got to end with some good news. And so let's end with redemption here. The question all this of chapter 34 is, where is the good news? Where's the answer? Where's God? Well, the good news, brothers and sisters, is right here. There will be consequences for what happened to Simeon and Levi. We'll get to that in Genesis 49. There's consequences to Jacob. But hear this. Jacob survives this whole horrible mess, and so do all of his family. Even though he has been a failure morally, even though he has been faithless and he hasn't trusted God to protect him, God has still been sovereign this entire time. God has still been in charge and God has been in control. God has delivered them yet again. Even when they won't turn to him, even when they are undeserving, God has been gracious to them. That old promise to Abraham that who curses you will be cursed, God keeps making it come true, despite Jacob deserving it or not. God is true even though man is a liar. God is faithful even when we're not. God is trustworthy even when we don't think we can trust him. God is righteous when we are sinful. God keeps his promises and his steadfast love when we don't. That is the good news. It's the good news. Deuteronomy 7, that part we read about intermarriage, it goes on to explain why God is like this. It's not because his people are so special in themselves. It's not because they're so deserving. It's not because they're powerful. It's not because they're awesome. He says this, it's because the Lord loves you. And he's keeping his oath that he swore that the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. That is the good news, is God is faithful to redeem even when we defile ourselves in his world. That is the good news. And it's very good news because there's the truth of the bad news. The bad news is all of us have done outrageous things that must not be done. We have all defiled God's word. We have all defiled ourselves and other people. We have done what ought not to be done. What God commanded us not to do, we have done. We live in a lawless world as lawless people because we've rejected God's law and become a law unto ourselves. We have seen with our own eyes what we say is good and we've reached out and seized it, no matter the consequences. The consequences have been humiliation and shame and alienation from God. It is sin. And it leaves us stuck in a slavery worse than Israel and Egypt, a slavery in sin. Then the burning question is, who in the world can fix this? Who could pay a ransom so high to get me out of that debt and liberate me from that kind of slavery? The answer is the gospel. It's Jesus Christ, precious blood. That's what it costs to redeem us, to liberate us out of slavery. We belonged to this world and he paid with his blood to set us free and transfer us to his kingdom and to make us a new people, set apart for him. I want to leave you with this from Titus 2. I'm going to start in verse 11, and I'll put up verse 14 and leave it there. For the grace of God has appeared, 
bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, to live as his holy people in an unholy land, waiting for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, verse 14, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, and to purify for himself a people of his own possession who are zealous for good works. Jesus Christ has redeemed us from the domain of darkness. By his blood, by his forgiveness and redemption, through his death and resurrection, all that I destroyed in my life, he rebuilds. All that I defiled in my relationship with him and other people, he redeems and buys it off. And he transferred me to a life with him to be what he wants me to be, glorifying him and enjoying him in his presence. And that's what I can do when he redeems me. All the things I defiled, he redeems by his blood. All that I have destroyed, he rebuilds and restores. That is the good news that Simeon and Levi need to hear and that we need to live by. Let us give praise to our Lord Jesus for that. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands. Lord, it's by the price of your precious blood that we have been forgiven our sins, set free from the clutches of this world, and transfer to your kingdom in you where we can glorify God and enjoy you forever. Praise be your name, our Redeemer. Thank you for your justice and your mercy. As you have set us apart, Lord, will your Holy Spirit continue to do his work in us to purify us that we are not like the people of the land, but we are increasingly like you, our Savior and that we are a light unto the people around us in this dark world, shining your truth and your mercy and your justice and proclaiming the very good news that you can redeem their defiled lives just like you did ours. Praise be your name, Jesus. Amen.